Hello, um, so welcome to our webinar um, and thanks to everyone who's joined us. Um, so my name is Jenny and I'm with the uh, Open Rights Group. Um, so we have uh, offices in London and um, Glasgow, so this is obviously the Glasgow branch. Um, so just a bit of housekeeping first, we're just going to just let you know that we're going to um, record this session, so uh, including the Q&A. So, um, but obviously your cameras uh, won't be on if you're asking questions. Um, so this talk is about um, surveillance and the right to dignity. Um, so all human beings have a right to dignity um, as described in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, this right must be protected and respected, yet increasingly we're seeing that large corporations systematically strip people of their rights. The sociopathic data extraction, stalking, monitoring and profiling of tech companies leads to breaches of privacy, but more importantly, it leads to a breach of dignity. The dignity is vital to our sense of self-worth on an individual level and accordingly on a societal level. Societies must value dignity and respect if they're going to prosper. Um, so we've, uh, we welcome our three panelists here um, to discuss these issues and provide, uh, provide their perspective on this question. Um, so we have three speakers um, and they will provide um, a good variety of perspectives um, as they do coming from different backgrounds. Um, so first of all, I'll introduce um, the speakers uh, one by one and then each of them will give a short talk on their uh, work. Um, so first of all, we've got um, Howard Io. Um, Howard is a doctoral researcher at the University of Ulster. Um, the research, uh, his research examines the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights. Um, in addition to his academic pursuit, Howard has long been involved in the practical human rights and development policy work. From 2009 to 2018, Howard joined the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Uganda as a program officer. His area's responsibilities included technical and advisory assistance to state institutions, civil society, and the grassroots. And second of all, we've got um, Maria Farrell. Um, Maria Farrell is a writer and keynote speaker on technology and the future. Um, she's an Irish citizen based in London. She's worked in technology policy for 20 years, um, including the World Bank, um, ICANN, the International Chamber of Commerce, Paris, the Confederation of British Industry, and the Law Society of England and Wales. Her current focus is on how to imagine and build technological and political futures most of us actively choose to live in. And Maria taught politics at, and policy at, at, at an Oxford University's doctoral program in cybersecurity from 2014 to 2018. Um, she's completing a PhD in creative writing at Goldsmiths University of London. Uh, Maria has written for The Guardian and appeared as a tech expert on BBC and Sky News. Um, so also here we've got Claire Llewellyn. Um, Claire is interested in the development and definition of cross-disciplinary methodological and ethical techniques and standards in the GovTech domain. She has extensive experience in working in a collaborative transdisciplinary environment and has produced and co-authored papers with academics from informatics, politics, social work, history, botany, criminology, linguistics, information studies and library science. Um, specifically, she has developed a novel data analysis techniques underpinned by data science technologies such as natural language processing, supervised and unsupervised machine learning, and statistical analysis. And her recent focus has been on developing and implementing studies to gather and analyze social media data and using these results either in combination with or as an underpinning for experimental and quantitative social science research. So, without further ado, we'll have our first speaker, who is Howard. So, over to you, Howard. Um, <clears throat> thank you um, very much. Uh, can you hear me from that side? Um, and my screen too, right? Yeah, um, can you hear me and the screen is good to go, right? Um, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Um, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, good night uh, from wherever the uh, participants are. Um, my name is Howard Ayo, um, and I'm a PhD researcher 
examining the National Action Plan on Business and, and Human Rights at Ulster University. Um, uh, but also, again, as Jenny uh, introduced me, I have uh, about 14 years of uh, experience in development and 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 and, and human rights work. Um, um, specifically, the focus of uh, the discussion um, this evening, I shall be uh, answering, trying to answer, not of course completely, uh, the question of um, whether the UK um, has progressed through the adoption of uh, a national action plan on business and, and, and human rights uh, regarding uh, the right to dignity, uh, or more specifically, um, the right to privacy, which forms an integral component of, a, of, a, of a surveillance and the right to dignity broadly. Um, if we, I take you slightly a little bit back. Um, in, in, in 2011, the UN um, um, uh, uh, came up with an implementation framework. Uh, of the UN guiding uh, principles on on on, on business and, and, and human rights uh, in a way to operationalize um, the protect respect and remedy uh, framework but um, immediately uh, after the launch in 2011 the UK government uh, made the first proposal um, for a implementation framework and and uh, the uh, the, the proposal focused on um, what we call the National Action Plan on, on, on Business and, and Human Rights. Um, uh, the recommendation uh, came uh, from um, the state process, which had already started a little bit earlier before the, uh, the adoption of the guiding principles uh, on business and human rights. And, and, and that is the Joint uh, Human Rights Committee. Uh, um, where they issued a report on um, um, a report called any of our business or human rights in the UK private sector and this report was very explicit on 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 the right to privacy as being one of the agenda areas that uh, a national action plan uh, for the UK should be exploring uh, possible ways um, how uh, it can be implemented or strengthened uh, within the domestic uh, protection framework. Um, in 2013 then, they, 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 uh, in September, um, the first business and um, National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights was launched, um, um, purely focusing on, 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 on uh, business and human rights areas largely. Uh, in just a minute, I'll I'll be trying to 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 give a snapshot of the commitment uh, that the UK government uh, made uh, therein. Um, this plan was implemented for about two and a half years, uh, and it was reviewed, and and that and that was in 2016. Now, um, the commitment, the first commitment, uh, I, I'll beg a bit of uh, patience because my my, my 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 slides here might be a little bit small, but I'll I'll, I'll read it. Um, they, um, they 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 the commitment uh, that came uh, from uh, the two thousand and nine report was the question of um, the, the 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 business enterprises adopting a human rights based approach to business. Um, it's it's a broad commitment that uh, that that report recommended, and 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 um, it was supposed to govern business uh, operations and practices generally. Now, in 2013, under the National Action Plan, um, there was an explicit commitment by the state to review the degree to which the activities of the UK state-owned, uh, controlled or supported enterprises and of state contracting and purchasing of goods and services are executed with respect for human rights and make recommendations to ensure uh, the compliance. And, and this is the commitment that came um, with, 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 with this National Action uh, Plan on, on, on Business and Human Rights. And if you, could, you can look at this, it's, it's very broad encompassing. 
that businesses generally, whether large or small, uh, should put human rights as as part of uh, the the their core uh, a day to day uh, um, work. Um, in 2016, um, uh, after the review um, of, of the, train, the first uh, National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights, the state went further, um, committing to adopt appropriate due diligence policies to identify, um, prevent, mitigate uh, human rights risk and commit to monitoring and evaluating um, uh, the implementation of, 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 of this NAP. Now, this commitment is, is on the part of the state is what they intend to see happen um, um, uh, uh, within uh, any business uh, enterprises. Now, um, um, if we go slightly um, to look into where uh, the government is coming from, um, Article 12. Article 8 um, uh, of the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, Article, sorry, um, Article 17 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and Article uh, 16 uh, of the Convention on the Rights of the Child are all very explicit uh, when it comes to uh, the issue of uh, the right to privacy. Now, um, the UK um, ratified um, all these treaties. Um, now, in 1998, um, the government went ahead uh, to give effect uh, to a specific um, uh, instrument, and that is the European Convention on Human Rights by enacting um, a, a, a legislation the, that is the Human Rights uh, Act to give further uh, effect to freedoms guaranteed uh, under um, uh, this convention. And the discussion I am having here is specific to Article um, 8, which is, which is uh, largely on, on, on the right to uh, 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 privacy and how it can be protected uh, domestically. However, um, under Article 6, and, and, and this is where the novelty or the question of uh, how can, uh, I mean, how far can this legislation go uh, when it comes to uh, um, uh, securing uh, the text of, 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 of this convention. Now, uh, Article 6 uh, re gives a very broad um, uh, uh, responsibility, especially when it comes to, um, um, sorry, uh, I'm, 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 I'm trying to, 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 to learn how to use this webinar. It's, I'm not so much familiar with it. Uh, but uh, under Article 6, um, there is there's a, there's a very broad um, uh, duty which which has been given, and that is that uh, um, acts of public uh, authorities, where um, section three is is saying, uh, paragraph B, that any person, um, uh, any person certain of whose functions are functions of a public nature, but does not include either House of Parliament or a person exercising functions in connection with proceedings of, of, of parliament are bound, uh, are duty bound by this uh, act. And, and the question is, um, if you are a private uh, business and you are performing a public function, does this act, uh, uh, are you bound by, 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 by the law? And, and this is a question which I'm going to be discussing uh, slightly ahead of, of, of my presentation. But I want to bring this to the attention that um, the question of public um, uh, public authorities extending uh, to private businesses, especially when they are performing a function of a public uh, nature, would be very important to look at it critically. Um, so, what is the current context? Um, there is largely a fragmentation of policies and and, and legislation. Uh, uh, broadly in the UK, and also the institutional framework 
I mean, institutions uh, that are supposed to be directly engaging or ensuring the implementation of these frameworks uh, remain largely frag fragmented and uncoordinated. Um, and also there is a very big gap in relation to capacity to enforce the existing framework. Uh, I would of course say that uh, um, it, the coming of the National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights has brought a lot of discussion um, in terms of how do this play out. Uh, so a lot of stakeholders are coming to term um, with uh, the relationship between businesses and, 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 and human rights and, and likewise uh, the fragmentation. Um, so uh, since uh, the adoption of, of, uh, of, of uh, the National Action Plan in 2013 and the subsequent amendment, I mean, uh, a revision in 2016, um, I, I, would, I would say the coming into being the, the Human Rights Act, um, uh, the Data Protection Act, uh, as amended in 2018, of course, uh, it came in, in, in 1998, the Gang Master Act, uh, the European Convention uh, on, on Human Rights, which of course is giving more uh, credence to the Human Rights Act and, and the Modern Slavery Act. And, and lastly, um, among others, the, the, the Companies Act have been very instrumental in shaping the discussion around uh, the relationship between businesses and human rights uh, in, the, in, in, in the UK. Um, specific attention, I, I, yeah, I want sorry, to... Sorry, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I'm just conscious of time. If you can maybe just start to sum up without your eyes. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Thanks. Um, uh, um, specific attention should be extended to the Companies Act. Um, uh, the Companies, the UK Companies Act is very um, explicit when it comes to incorporation of businesses. And one of and one of the, the, the issues that are raised under Section 172 of this Act is the duties to promote success of the company by, by the directors. The directors are, 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 are under duty uh, to ensure that human rights form part of, um, is an integral component of the company, uh, not only in terms of uh, uh, co in cooperation, but also compliance. And, um, this act was amended in 2013 and giving more powers to, to, to the directors to include human rights as a component uh, of, of the functions of, 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 of business enterprises. And now what does this mean? Uh, it is unimplied that businesses are supposed to have human rights due diligence uh, as a mandatory or uh, the duty bound to have human rights due, um, due diligence. Now, um, some of the cases which have shaped uh, greatly the discussions around this right to privacy. Uh, recently is the case uh, Bridges versus South Wales. Uh, you might have heard about the automated uh, facial recognition locate program uh, that has been ordered to be inconsistent with uh, 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 the Data Protection uh, Act, um, uh, specifically, uh, um, the, the, the scope of, of, of the data that is being extracted by, uh, by the police force. Um, uh, it's so broad that uh, it, is, it, it has been put to question that, uh, that the police practice needs to be reviewed, um, uh, not to uh, over infringe on, on these specific rights. Then uh, you might have heard about uh, the Big Brother's Watch um, uh, uh, case um, where the European uh, Court of Human Rights uh, also found um, the UK surveillance uh, program, uh, especially uh, the one led by the government communications uh, headquarters uh, to be um, very broad in terms of its application and directly interfering with the the right to 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 to, to privacy uh, and and the last case that I want to bring on board and 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 again as I said earlier on what what is arising under the Human Rights Act um, uh, is 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 the case of let me use L versus uh, Birmingham City Council 
where they were testing what it means by functions of a public nature. Uh, if, for example, a company is given a contract to to work on to uh, to, to to work on on a road, um, um, the, the the question would be: Has the government delegated the powers to uh, to the company, or uh, and are they? Uh, does the Human Rights Act extend uh, to, uh, the duty uh, which is expected of the state to uh, uh, the private company? Um, the nuances around this has not yet been resolved up to now. Um, in, oh, sorry, in, if you could just, um, sorry, I'm just conscious of time. If you could maybe just sum up in a minute or two, yeah, would that be all right? Yeah, yeah I, am, I, am, I am finalizing on this. So the, the, the discussion remains very, very broad around what it means for a private, uh, I mean, private entities or business enterprises to perform uh, um, uh, activities of a public, uh, a public nature. Uh, does the the, the act uh, uh, extend to uh, extend to them? Um, in 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 conclusion, um, um, whether there has been any progress or not, um, a lot of discussion needs to be uh, be made, especially clarifying one, uh, what it means for a private entity to perform uh, uh, services of a public nature. And two, um, to help um, um, strengthen uh, capacities broadly of the stakeholders to understand, um, um, especially companies, that they are under, they are bound by uh, by the Companies Act to have a human rights due diligence policy uh, at the at the at the workplaces. And also uh, to take cognizance that uh, the, 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 this policy framework gives grounds for a lot of uh, different options that can help um, uh, achieve state obligations, especially when it comes to protecting the right of privacy. And we could be exploring a possibility of a program on business and human rights to strengthen the rights holders' uh, knowledge and skills in this specific area. Uh, so that they can help um, uh, as in giving state an oversight function uh, and also demand for much more accountability on the part of the state and business enterprises. Um, and also the promotional um, uh, uh, element uh, of this can be achieved through this process. So um, in a nutshell, I, I would stop here. Um, I, I, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much. That was really interesting. It's a good kind of like thorough legislative background there. That was really good. Um, I should have just said at the start, um, if you have any questions for our speakers, you can just pop them in the chat there and we'll hopefully be able to answer a few of them at the end. Um, so moving on, we'll go on to our second speaker, who's Dr. Claire Llewellyn. Over to you. Thanks. Are you all right or are you on mute? <laughs> uh, Matt should be in the background there helping if you have any technical difficulties. Yeah, I've just switched. Um... I've just switched over to Claire. I mean, maybe having the same problem as we had earlier this evening. Um, Ray, would you be willing to jump in or? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll swap, I'll swap over to Maria now. Right. Hi everyone. Um, so my name is M Maria Farrell, and I am kind of coming to this both as an uh, a policy advocate. I've been involved with Open Rights Group for some years, and many other organisations going back about twenty years. But I'm also coming to this as a writer and as somebody who um, kind of thinks a lot about the creative process and how you continue to do it um, in 
a world where you're increasingly surveilled and potentially manipulated. So, um, so I'm going to tell just a qu really quick story first. And um, this one is about kind of why I do what I do, I guess. So a few years ago, I was on a panel in Brussels and it was with um, a bunch of um, tech policy people, lobbyists, and a couple of um, the data protection supervisors, um, Giovanni Buttarelli, may he rest in peace, uh, at the time the European Data Protection Supervisor, um, and also um, Wojciech Vivjarovski, uh, um, who was the Assistant Data Protection Supervisor then, and is 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 in the the top job now. Um, we it was one of those kind of uh, awkward panels. Um, where um, data protection came up against um, the tech lobby. And, and I won't go into that, but I will tell you about at the very end of the panel, um, uh, all of the, the sort of the lobbyists cleared the stage pretty quickly. And it ended up with just being me, uh, Wojciech and Giovanni, um, just chatting really, really enthusiastically because it was one of those panels where you've got lots of things to talk about afterwards. Um, and we were pretty pleased about some of the things that had happened on the panel. And, um, Wojciech actually after about two minutes and it felt like it was a meeting of old friends although I'd never actually talked to those two guys before um, after about two minutes Wojciech just leaned in and he just said why is it that it's always the Catholics who are so interested in privacy and, and Giovanni just kind of burst out laughing and obviously I was laughing too being an Irish person I was like yeah why is it always the Catholics so obsessed with privacy um, and I think there are kind of possibly two reasons there one of them is uh, maybe some of us anyway know what it's like to grow up under surveillance in a theocracy um, or something very close to one. And um, but also kind of on the flip side of that, there's there's a lot of there's a sort of a whole Catholic doctrine about the dignity of the human person. And I found this incredibly intensely annoying as a teenager, but I've looked into it a bit more since. And actually, I think it's there's something to it. And you don't have to be Catholic, you know, to 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 find this compelling. Um, but there's so I'm just going to read something from a statement by the Catholic bishops of America um, uh, something they said about economic justice. And I think this really gets to the heart of dignity and surveillance and capitalism. And they said all human beings, therefore, are ends to be served that as in the humans are the ends um, rather than the means. OK, I'm going to start that again. That's not obvious. All human beings, therefore, are ends to be served by the institutions that make up the economy not means to be exploited for more narrowly defined go goals. Human personhood must be respected with a reverence that is religious. And so I think what they're trying to get at there is that we are not uh, widgets and we're not tools and we're not kind of objects to be instrumentalized for other uh, purposes. Um, but I think often, you know, under capitalism and in particularly surveillance capitalism, we kind of do feel like we are basically a set of attributes or we're a role, we're a function, we're something to be exploited. Um, and I think we can all feel in our gut that, you know, we're more than that. And so I think a lot of people are involved in tech policy because, uh, you know, not because they're Catholics, but because they've got some, you know, strong feeling in their gut of, humans exist for our own purposes we don't we're not here to be instrumentalized by others and i think that's why you know we so strongly feel that there needs to be a, a rebalancing of power in in a society of increasingly ubiquitous surveillance and manipulation i think one of the things that that kind of does that rebalancing is having an equality of looking and being looked at I mean, the whole thing about, you know, being being surveilled as you walk down the street or um, having your phone track um, data about you the whole time and, and share it with parties with whom you have no contract, you know, with uh, the whole ad, ad network. Um, it, it's incredibly disempowering because you don't know who's watching you um, and you can only suspect. But, um, you know, kind of going back a little bit in history to other people who have need have had need of creative and intellectual freedom. Um, Immanuel Kant famously took a walk through Konigsberg, where he lived, at the same time every single day. You could set your watch by this guy. And so, you know, on the one hand, you could say Kant was surveilled. Everybody knew, you know, where he was going to be at a given moment. And in fact, the whole town, it, it sort of became a bit of an institution. Everybody goes to see, you know, Kant walking, taking his walk at the same time every day. But at the same time, he was able to see other people as they were able to see him. So there's a sort of a fundamental equality of seeing and being seen that meant that he wasn't disempowered by by being seen, being known, having his habits known. 
having people be able to infer things about him from his behavior in the same way as our, our phones and, and you know other companies do about us so you, you didn't have that kind of anxious you know this asymmetry of of being observed by people you yourself cannot observe um but you know in our lives um a week ago the financial times reported that clear channel uh, a big international company that runs uh, most of the billboards that you see kind of around london where i live um, that they were going to start collecting the unique MAC addresses, uh, MAC identifiers on everybody's mobile phone who walks past their billboard. Now, you can't opt out of walking past a billboard if it's going to collect a unique identifier about you. But they're collecting that data because they want to track footfall and they want to see where people go and they want to see if they pick you up, you know, passing another billboard later in the day. Um, so we don't have that equality of looking and being looked at that I think is so powerful um, and so necessary um, to have that feeling of kind of dignity and agency in your life. Um, there are plenty of writers who talk about this a lot, um, you know, the, the feeling, the needing to be private and to not be seen. Virginia Woolf famously wrote about, oh, to be private, to be alone, to be submerged, because she sensed, and I think most of us do that, in order to do really, really good groundbreaking creative work, or in order to do um, really, you know, novel and pushing forward um, intellectual work, we need to create like nobody is watching. That's how we do this stuff. You know, you don't come up with fantastic new ideas if um, you're having to basically be in public with them the whole time. You don't come up with good creative work, like with novels, with poetry, if you have to kind of present your raw thoughts all the time. So, you know, so when we talk about human dignity, we're also talking about sort of a capacity or be creative to make mistakes to get it wrong to try again those are things that we need for our basic humanity and also to come up with good artistic work and to come up with new political ideas zadie smith the british writer said something along the lines of you know i understand it's important to be appropriate in public life in social life in political life but in your soul no this is a different thing Again, you know, artists and intellectuals have so often been the people who protect that zone around us, that zone, not just of privacy. I think privacy is the wrong word for it because data protection is not going to protect us. It's a zone of autonomy that allows us to move through the world for our own purposes, not for the purpose of being instrumentalized by others. So um, uh, I guess I'll probably probably leave it leave it at that just um, because I know we're, we're going to be running a little short on time. One final comment, um, I saw somebody writing today that there's a growing narrative in Silicon Valley that you know total surveillance is going to be some kind of civil, civilizational next step. Um, Peter Schwartz of Salesforce said, gradually we will accept much, much greater surveillance and in the end, we won't be too bothered by it. Um, I would say surveillance is not a sign of pro progress. Surveillance is going backwards. It's a regression. It's going back to feudalism. It's going back to theocracy. It's going back to totalitarianism. And when you add in the, the manipulation that, that comes with data collection and, and ubiquitous surveillance, you're basically doing cognitive imperialism. Well, guess what? We tried imperialism already. It was a terrible idea. Um, you know, we don't want to go back there again. So broadly speaking, I think, you know, in order to be thinking of new futures, thinking of new politics, new art, new creation, we need to preserve our private zone, the zone of dignity, whether you think of it in Catholic terms or whether you just think of it in terms of, of your own uh, intuition that we need to create like nobody is watching to, to, you know, to create like nobody is there. And then we bring, then we bring it out, then we share it with other people. That's how we've always done it. And that's how we move society forward. That's how we create progress. And that's how we create futures that we actively want to live in. Thanks. There's some really interesting ideas there. Thank you so much for that. That's really interesting. Um, I'm just wondering if, uh, Claire, are you ready to go now? I think you can hear me. Which oh yeah, good. we can hear you. Great. That's a start. <laughs> <laughs> terrible technical problems today oh dear right hopefully i'm going to share some slides and i will talk okay. you through that and it seems to be working this is a miracle we're bound to be bothered by cats and children in a second just so things are 
don't go according to plan. So my name is Claire Llewellyn. I work at the University of Edinburgh and I'm a computer scientist, a data scientist. So I process in the main social media data. I originally worked in a computer science department, but now I work in a politics department. So I'm looking to use data science to answer political science questions. So looking at referendum, general elections, that type of thing. And I was thinking, listening to Maria and thinking about what she was saying about instrumentalization. And it's always very important to remember that if you're not paying for something online, you are the product, you are the thing that's being sold. So what I want to talk about today is a little bit about how our social media data is reused, how I reuse it and how it can be re reused in a couple of different ways. But we'll try and jump through it really quickly so we've got some time for questions. Right, we want to actually view full screen and then I can actually do the slides. Right, so I'm going to skip past this because it's not interesting for today's discussion. So social media data is can be accessed, it is in the public domain. So when you put something on social media, you own that piece of information you're putting out there, but you actually sign away the rights for that data to be reused. And in that way, I sign up for the terms of service of a social media company, and it allows me to reuse the data. I work at a university and I aim to be ethical and moral in all use of this data. But obviously that's not the case for everyone. So we're gonna quickly look at um, a couple of things in the Twitter user agreement. So that's the thing you sign up to when you sign up to use Twitter. And then we'll look at the Twitter development agreement. So that's what I sign up to when um, I want to use your data. And hopefully it'll give you a bit more of an idea of, of what's allowed and how the data is used. So these are extremely long documents and it's the kind of thing that people don't read when they want to start using any of these sites, people scroll through, they tick accept all and um, they don't actually read how things are being used. Um, so you can see kind of the most important things is that you own the data, they take no responsibility for what you're putting there, but they own the rights to give, sell or reuse any of your data. Uh, so by posting the content, you agree to, to use this and they agree to um, be able to make money because you're getting a free service. They make money off the data that you're putting there. On top of that, not only do you agree that they can use your content, you agree that other people can use your content and they can build services on top of that. So they can't share your information directly, but they can build a service on top of that, which they can then monetize. So the developer agreement, once again, huge, huge long pieces of text um, that we actually do read because we want to make sure what we're doing is right. Basically, what I can't do is I cannot conduct surveillance on Twitter users. I cannot use the data that I find to discriminate in any way. I must be consistent with a Twitter user's reasonable expectation of privacy, which is quite a tricky one, really, because I think Twitter users expect their data to be private unless they are a verified user. So we tend to steer away from using individual data. And also you can't target individuals based on sensitive personal information. And so for us, that means political profile. We can't target someone depending on their political profile. Mm -hmm. So we don't identify users unless they're verified users. We don't present any results on individuals. We don't reuse any specific text because if you take a text from a tweet and enter it into Google, you get back to that person. And we don't share any of the content that we, we take from Twitter. But not everyone does this. I want to, to quickly look at um, the example of Russian trolls and how your data is reused by Russian trolls. So Russian trolls are people who are employed by a company that is instructed by the Russian government to pretend to be certain people online. And they spend a lot of their time creating fake content. So we're gonna look at how these users profile, profile you and how they integrate into the groups that you're part of. So this was work we did a couple of years ago. Um, 
there was a lot of media attention, obviously. We were looking, I had a huge data set that was over, I think it's 40 million tweets on the Brexit referendum. I was contacted by a journalist who asked, there was a list of um, Russian trolls submitted to the American Senate for a hearing, and these were identified as Russian trolls by Twitter. And he asked me to look in our data set to see if they were tweeting about Brexit, which they were. We were seeing they were tweeting a lot on the day of the 23rd, just before the referendum. And kind of that aspect of this isn't that important. It's more the fact of what the trolls were trying to do. So they were run by the Internet Research Agency. There was um, many different accounts within our data set. Um, Twitter has deleted these tweets, so you can't actually see them online. The only place they exist is in places like our data sets. Hmm. And what we found is they were pushing Brexit, but they were talking about it in a way that was related to the Trump election campaign and the Germany election campaign and to do with Turkey in their election as well. So they were using Brexit as a way to destabilise the narrative around European and American politics. Um, you can see they talked about different things, so a lot on Germany, a lot on refugees. And this was all related to Brexit. So any of the tweets with this content in also had something about Brexit in there. And what this is, is it, it's what's termed as active measures. So it's a way to spread disruptive information. So no one really knows what they're reading is true or what is right, and everything feels unsettled. And that's, that's the idea behind it. It's also to create um, what we call astroturfing, which is a fake grassroots movement. So these people pretend to be in grassroots movements. We saw a lot that there was a lot of, uh, they were posing as American Christians, they were posing as Black Lives Matters um, activists, they were posing as Germans, Italians, mainly Americans. Um, but they weren't these people. They were pretending to be these people. They were integrating with people on Twitter. They were following them. They were being followed back. Some of them had millions of followers and they were pretending to be other people. And they were doing this because they wanted to convince the type of people they were pretending to be to act in a different way. They were taking your data from your user accounts. They were trying to become friends with you. And then they were trying to change your opinion. You know, we've also heard of nudge theory. So it's slowly changing people's opinion whilst being in the group. Essentially, it's a form of propaganda and it's based on uh, misleading information. Um, just as the quick takeaway, the idea uncertainly increases. No one trusts what they read. Everything's fake news. Nothing's fake news. And that's the whole idea behind all of these things. Creates a normalizing effect. So if you see something a lot, you start to believe it's true. And because these accounts contain fake information, you are more likely to trust people who are like you. So if you see that someone is like you, you're more likely to trust what they say. But they're not like you because these are fake accounts. Um, and I will stop there. So we have a bit of time for questions. I hope that's OK with everyone. And there's a link to our paper if anyone would like to have a look at any point. Okay, you know, that was really interesting. Um, I guess I don't see any questions there at the moment. I just, I'll just kick off the questions now. Um, just to start with, I've got one there for Howard. Um, do you think that um, GDPR would be sufficient to uh, you know, protect employees from surveillance by their employers? It's 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 difficult to get directly into that um, um, because the landscape is not uh, conducive um, mm -hmm. um, for 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 data to be uh, protected. There is so much power that has been vested in the hands of the private sector, and and mm -hmm. and this is trying to create an imbalance a, um, um, or in in terms of the state securing um, the obligation. Uh, that uh, to protect, um, but 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 I think if you look into um, uh, moving from just commitment to compliance, uh, we in the current state um, uh, companies are under obligation uh, to report on 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 human rights, especially where there's a potential 
uh, risk, high, high, high risk area, should be made as part of their strategic reports at the end of the at the end of the period. So we could easily um, um, uh, advocate for companies uh, to, um, to have human rights due diligence as part of their their processes, and this should come at the end of their strategic reports uh, because the company directors are being put to test. Uh, uh, in, in, in in this regard, um, that's that's the the, the only angle. But um, the, the policy, legislative, and and institutional um, framework remains largely fragmented um, mm-hmm. uh, to easily help uh, in, in in I mean to get to your to your question. So I would mm-hmm. say not not now. Yeah. Okay, and I'll throw that to the other two uh, panelists. Do you think just in general that GDPR is sufficient to protect people um, from surveillance? Clay, do you want to answer that? Or? Um, from my aspect, so from taking it from a social media point of view, certainly mm-hmm. not barely mm-hmm. touches the surface. And also, whenever you sign up to a social media account, you agree that the data doesn't can be stored in different countries, including the US. So, I mean, they, there is some effort to comply, but I don't. I think there's always a way to get around it. And the problem is, we have to do it. It's great that it's done at a European level; that's fantastic. Yeah. But it's we almost have to agree this at a world level. It's got to be kind of a a, a fundamental thing. And GDPR isn't there yet. Right. Maria, do you? Yeah, briefly, I suppose um, I, GDPR has a lot wrong with it, and it's it's done a lot of really really good things as well. Um, so the one, I guess, the one problem, the major problem with GDPR is it's it's a somewhat cumbersome piece of legislation um, in that you know you have to work quite hard to comply with it, and you should have to because this stuff is really important. And um, so that's mm-hmm. not a criticism. But there is an indirect consequence of it, and that does mean that larger companies with more resources and capacity may find it easier to comply with GDPR. And you know, the data is beginning to come in that shows GDPR does help to drive dominance by large tech firms in particular who find it easier to comply. So, um, so there's a competition aspect of GDPR in that of, of you know of many forms of regulation if they're not carefully thought of. Um, to avoid uh, giving more power to companies that already have power unfortunately they can they can tend to amplify inequality it's something we see a lot um i think it just means we have to we have to try harder on competition law you know there there are ways and means we don't repeal gdpr we just say okay we need to go harder on competition um mm-hmm. but gdpr you know it is about how data is treated and I think with tech and surveillance and ubiquitous surveillance and behavioral manipulation, this goes far beyond, you know, a tick box for consent that lets a company yeah. do what it will. Um, it's it's about power and power symmetry, and that's going to take a lot more work over the next couple of decades. Okay. Okay. Um, we've got a question here from Attila. So it's a question for Claire. Um, after the UK leaves the EU, European laws and GDPR regulations won't be applicable anymore. Do you expect an increase in mass surveillance? I don't think that's just a question for me, actually. I think it goes beyond. It's not just social mm, media. Yeah. That's true. Um, I, as far as social media, I don't think an awful lot will change because the rules that we follow are they are coming from the companies that that aren't being enforced by the governments and GDPR Mm -hmm. at the moment in the way that the surveillance is done, that I see it. I mean, maybe someone else can speak more to GDPR and what it means with Brexit, but it won't make any difference for the social media companies. Okay. Yeah, Um, yeah, I think the UK is going to have a very hard time um, achieving an adequacy finding that the UK's implementation of GDPR is compliant with, um, you know, sufficiently compliant that data transfers can continue. But I think ultimately that's going to be a political question and the UK may somehow pull a rabbit out of the hat and, um, you know, haven't decided politically that for some hand wavy fig leaf reason, um, the European Commission will 
agree to pretend that the GDPR is is okay. Um, so it's possible that you know it, it will continue in that sense. Um, but I think going forward, the UK is going to be increasingly out of compliance with the rest of Europe. Um, that's for sure. Yeah. And and if you look at the, 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 the recent order by uh, uh, by by the court of uh, I mean the case which has just been disposed of uh, that was uh, last week, uh, the court of appeal. Um, uh, uh, the legitimacy of the automated facial recognition—I uh, mean, recognition locate program—it has a very long name. Uh, they're trying to, to to now start to question the scope of data to be collected, and uh, and and and, and th 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 this order, the police has openly come out to say that uh, we have not done anything, uh, we have not breached any law. So we're gonna continue uh, to move this way, and and this tells you how practice and 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 the law is is getting far from 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 each other. Um, but the order is very explicit. That look here, you have you have to review um, the risk associated with uh, uh, the kind of uh, 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 program that that you are. Uh, coming up with, and they're saying no, uh, and 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 this has not been piloted only once, all the way from 2018. Uh, it's 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 starting to gain more prominence. But how far do you want, uh, 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 in terms of data, to be collected? Uh, and and uh, Maria talked about uh, how far can you go into our private lives? Uh, the the facial, I mean the in and the in. I, I, IA is called uh, artificial intelligence uh, system. They are, they are being trained on actual data, which is being collected, for example, my face, your mm -hmm. face. Uh, it's being trained on how to recognize such kind of data. And we do not know what kind of data, I mean, where are these data being collected from uh, to train uh, the artificial intelligence? And, and the question of um, uh, discrimination and equality um, was also uh, questioned uh, um, uh, um, by, by 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 the judges, um, and 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 this tells you that uh, even if we move away from from um, from from the EU, uh, the question of uh, the domestic framework being effective uh, in terms of protecting the rights holders will still be a long way. Um, um, to achieve. Yeah. Yeah, and um, that's true. Um, so we'll just take one more question. So for all the panelists from Marta, social media, to what extent using alternative services such as diaspora could protect us from surveillance? So that's actually a really good question. I'm just going to ask my like that question myself. So what practical steps can people actually take, you know, to protect themselves? Do you want to take that first, uh, Maria? Uh, sure. Um, don't ever put Facebook on your mobile phone. Uh, <laughs> okay. <never. laughs> up. Don't use WhatsApp. Don't use Instagram. I mean, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so so there, there are steps that people can take. Um, and many of them involve, you know, cutting themselves off from social media networks that they would like to be part of. Um, I'm not, I don't use WhatsApp. I don't use a smartphone. Um, I'm not on, on my family WhatsApp group. And I miss so much stuff. So, you know, that makes me think this is not a behavioral problem that I am going to fix by myself by being, you know, a refusing. And this is a political problem that we have to fix via our governments and via democratic accountability. Yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting how you say that because it's always a trade off, isn't it? You know, we, we're offered a service and we are giving something away for that service. You know, if you want to be on Facebook, you want to be on Twitter, you are being commoditized and they will taking things from you. And they are taking mm -hmm. that data and they're selling it to other people and we don't know where that's going. And that can't be, because so many people are on these sites, it can't be regulated at an individual level. It has to be government legislation. And I can't understand why that's not happening. I mean after the Cambridge Analytica scandal, when people suddenly woke up to the fact that they were being 
spied upon, commoditized, used, you know, things were being based on their data. I thought we were going to see a change and it's not really happened in the way that I thought I would. Yeah, well, unfortunately, because the, the you know, the electoral outcome, which that helped to secure, um, has brought into place a political constellation that is absolutely fine with that outcome. And it's it's kind of tragic. Yeah. But it doesn't mm -hmm. mean we stop working. You know, we keep working on it. That's that's why we're all here. Mm -hmm, exactly. I, I, I think also the, the state strengthening um, uh, the regulative, I mean, the regulation around businesses broadly uh, in um, regarding um, the respect for human rights because it remains it remains a, a voluntary component. Businesses are not under obligation to um, to, 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 to respect human rights. Um, uh, and, and, and this is the lacuna uh, which, which we are having right now. They will tell you that is the core responsibility of the state uh, mm -hmm. and the state has to, the state has to deal to deal with it. Now, um, I, I just gave you an example of, of, of the Companies Act, which is trying to uh, explicitly tell companies that you have to have a human rights due diligence as part of... Uh, now, imagine if uh, this is a company uh, that is working across jurisdiction. Um, it's not only working in the UK. It has uh, subsidiaries cut across globally. How easy is it to regulate um, or apply uh, 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 standards which are not only govern them uh, domestically, but also their work outside uh, um, um, uh, the, the the home state. Um, so uh, strengthening um, uh, the policy and legislative environment would go a long way. And and because it's at the end of the day, as Maria and and Claire said, human beings can't be treated as commodity. Um, but in reality, this is what is happening. The data about me and you is being is being is being used uh, to profile or come up with products or services against your will, um, uh, and, and 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 this is this has to stop. But but more importantly, um, again, strengthening um, rice holders' capacity. We need to broaden awareness or promotional activities that can help. Are the rights holders or the consumers uh, as businesses would want to 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 call them uh, to understand um, their rights and they should be been be i mean we should create a platform for recourse mechanism platforms which are effective um, uh, not abstract uh, orders like with the one which has just been issued uh, last week that uh, the police force should review their practice how should they review their practice Yet they, they 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 still don't have capacity adequate enough for them, in, especially in in the area of human rights. Mm -hmm. So it's it's uh, um, that's my opinion anyway, uh, based on the data I'm okay. seeing. <laughs> okay, that's true. I think that's a good note to end on. I'm really sorry we don't have any time for any more questions. Just some really good questions there, unfortunately. Um, so just say thank you so much to all the panelists. They were really interesting talks and really interesting um, points that you've made. So I think the fundamental takeaway is don't use social media and implement your national action plans. <laughs> okay, thanks very much to everyone who joined. Uh, it's been really interesting. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.